Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at VAFB.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce the wonderful local products we enjoy. Brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Virginia farmers set export records last year, but current events are clouding that success. Chive biscuits are a delicious springtime treat, and more farmers are raising goats in Virginia than ever before. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. Welcome back to Real Virginia, everyone. We're coming to you this week from a goat farm in Culpeper County, which we'll visit with more later in the show. But first, let's talk about trade. Virginia exports were at a record high last year. But Norm Hyde reports this year, the news has not been reassuring. Virginia politicians and farm leaders did a little celebrating last month. Governor Glenn Youngkin announced Virginia farm exports went through the roof in 2021, giving the state's farm economy a welcome boost. Last year we exported more than $4.1 billion in agriculture and forestry products. At an all-time high for the Commonwealth, in fact, it was 28% higher than the year before, and guess what? Records were made to be broken. We are off to an extraordinary start in 2022. Virginia was not alone in celebrating a bump in overseas sales. In 2021, U.S. farm exports hit $177 billion, 18% higher than the year before, despite shipping delays and supply chain challenges. And the worldwide exports of many U.S. products, including soybeans, corn, beef, pork, dairy, distiller's grains, and pet food, all reached all-time highs. And so we're currently forecasting another record year of exports in 2022, up by more than $10 billion over the previous year. Deputy Secretary of Agriculture Dr. Jewel Brona told the 14th Annual Virginia Governors Conference on Agricultural Trade that American farm exports to China, Mexico, Canada, South Korea, the Philippines, and Colombia all expanded in 2021. The former Virginia Commissioner of Agriculture and Consumer Services says Africa is poised to become a major new export market for American farm products. But looming over all the good news was the war between Russia and Ukraine. Because Ukraine has been one of the top grain exporters in the world, supply chains are now in chaos. And the markets are trying to figure out how much product is going to be up, out there, when is it going to be, be available, and they're trying desperately to price uh, wheat and corn and, and all of the products we're going to talk about. It's all dependent on a calendar, right? So uh, Russian and uh, Ukrainian wheat was, was predominantly sown um, you know, last fall, September, October, and we're looking at uh, a harvest on a normal calendar of July, August. But a lot is going to happen between now and July and August. That uncertainty has put world grain markets in turmoil, according to Essex County grain farmer Scott Mundy. Grain prices on the Chicago Board of Trade shot up at the outbreak of war in Eastern Europe, but they're not the major uncertainty factor. The booming price of crude oil is the real worry. We are looking at, at new crop prices that are coming up, uh, but they have not uh, come up at the same speed as our input prices have climbed. Uh, we've seen you know three and 400 percent increases uh, in, in our inputs, uh, fertilizer, fuel, uh, fuel has doubled uh, in, the, in the last uh, two years, and, and that, that affects every aspect of, of production agriculture. Monday farms in the eastern Virginia grain belt and has millions of bushels of grain stored on his farm. While he's looking at using 10,000 gallons of diesel fuel to plant this spring's crops, that's not the real problem. Each of his grain deliveries cost him twice as much as a year ago in fuel. Meanwhile, the price of planting his crops will be far higher than last year, and any profits will be driven by higher input costs instead of higher grain prices. So a friend of mine always says, uh, it's not about the money that you make, it's about the money that you keep. And we do, uh, or we are in a position 
to gross more revenue should we raise a good crop this coming year. The flip side of that is there's going to be a higher increase in the cost of production than we're going to enjoy in the increase in commodity prices. World prices for all grains are higher thanks to the war in Ukraine, but that won't be a saving grace, Mundy says. And the prospect of a drawn out war means Ukrainian farmers may be completely out of luck this year. They're trying to tend to their crops and, and there's tanks in the field, you know, and the, and the fuel is being used for the war effort. So what can they get done? If, even, if they, even if they are brave enough to go in the field, what can they get done? You know, and that's what the market is still trying to figure out. What kind of crop uh, is, is likely to come out of Ukraine? Monday says he's no good with cards, so he'd rather gamble in the field than Las Vegas. But this spring, farmers like him are making some of the biggest bets of their lives as they plant the seeds for 2022's crops. In Essex County, Virginia, I'm Norm Hyde reporting. Virginia farmers have been shipping products overseas since 1614, when the first tobacco crop was sent back to England. Today, Virginia has one of the finest deepwater ports on the East Coast, capable of accepting the largest cargo container ships afloat. And the port has doubled its shipping container capacity in the past year to provide even more export and import opportunities. Additional rail service has been added to the port, and Purdue Agribusiness is expanding its grain handling facilities in Norfolk. Soybeans, tobacco, hardwood timber, and grains are the top farm export products from the Old Dominion. I'm Mark Viette. Coming up on In the Garden, I'm going to talk about what happens to your trees if you get a serious freeze in the spring. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Bill McDonald, a cattleman in Montgomery County, Virginia. A new Census of Agriculture will be mailed out this fall, and that. it's your <laughs> chance to be counted because your farm counts. If you're an ag producer who did not receive a 2017 census and you don't currently receive other USDA surveys, please sign up by going to the website on your screen. The Census of Agriculture is your voice, your future, and your opportunity. Great. Fruit trees are a part of many home garden landscapes, but every spring they face the risk of late frost. Mark Viette explains why that's a problem in the garden. We live here in the Shenandoah Valley in between Stanton and Waynesboro. This year has been very unusual and we get these years maybe one out of every three years. Everything's been warm. The soil temperature is 57 degrees now. But a couple weeks ago, we had very cold weather, down to 14 degrees. At that point in time, the crab apples and a Bradford pear, this is a crab apple, were just coming into bloom. Now they come into bloom with the flower buds first, then they produce foliage. So we came out after that cold weather and I looked at the buds and I said, wow, it looks like those buds have been damaged. These here still have flower buds, but they're not opening. Once the crab apple starts producing leaves, you're gonna get no flowers. In this case, all the buds froze. So it affects the biggest thing, the honeybees. They love crab apples in the spring, but it's also, and there's a little bit of old fruit left right here, one of the old fruit. So every night, even now in the spring and also in the winter, I would walk out in the evening and there'd be deer feeding on the fallen crab apples. In addition to that, the robins, the mockingbirds, all these other birds that feed on the fruit, they're gonna miss it this year because we're not gonna have any fruit. So it's gonna be a pretty big uh, devastating blow to wildlife. But once you start getting the foliage, remember you're not gonna have flowers. There really isn't any pruning I'm gonna do now. I don't know if there's any damage, but if there's any other damage, you can prune that out by hand. Let's go look at some Bradford pears. I'm standing here in front of a field of wild invasive Bradford pears. Now some of us have it in the garden. You can plant varieties that don't recede 
and varieties that have a nice open shape. But due to a hard freeze, now a hard freeze is when you start getting down to 20 degrees, damaged all the flowers. These Bradfords were in full flower. It damaged all the flowers and there's gonna be no fruit on these this year, which feed the birds and feed the deer. So, uh, you know, at least they won't be seeding out from that fruit, but there's not much you can do for these Bradford pears when they freeze like this. And that's called a hard freeze. But if you have peaches or if you have apples or if you have desirable fruit trees, you can protect them if they're not too big. Even this you could protect. You can go ahead and cover it with the sheet and put a light sheet, you don't want anything heavy, and then tie it at the base of the tree. And then you're gonna put an incandescent light bulb, like a 100 watt light bulb, not an LED light. You want something that gives off heat. And that will bring the temperature inside where your peaches and other fruit trees will not freeze. The one redeeming quality of Bradford's is that, and I see a couple here, is they're a great plant that attracts pollinators. And usually the Bradford pear is one of the few things in bloom that feed the honeybees. There'll be thousands of honeybees on each tree. But with the damage we experience, which is not common, one out of every couple years, there is no food for the honeybees. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Hi, I'm Chef Tammy Brawley from The Green Kitchen. Coming up on Heart of the Home, chive biscuits with country ham and Dijon mustard. We hope you'll stay with us. And now, a sneak peek into a day in the life of a Virginia dairy cow. They get their day started. They have some lunch. Get some exercise. Spend time with their friends. And then end their day with dairy sweet dreams. Real dairy, real life, real delicious. Homemade biscuits are always a treat. Chef Tammy Brawley shows us how to add a unique herb to give them some punch in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Chef Tammy Brawley from The Green Kitchen, and today we're here to make some delicious chive biscuits with Dijon mustard and country ham. We're gonna start out with two cups of all-purpose flour into our KitchenAid mixer. It also has a tablespoon of baking powder, it has a tablespoon of sugar, and a little bit of salt. We're gonna just kinda of blend that up to start. Now you wanna have cold butter already ready and diced, and you're going to want to slowly start turning the mixer up in speed. And it is a whole stick of butter, um, or a quarter of a pound, to two cups of flour. We're going to turn the speed up a little bit more, get it nice and mixed. Now I'm going to turn it down because I'm coming back to add my liquid. You wouldn't want to add liquid on a high speed for obvious reasons. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to add about three quarters of a cup of our um, half and half. Let that get nice and mixed. I am going to go ahead and turn this off for a moment because you want to have some chives waiting and you want to go ahead and get those nice and chopped up. Now this is a, certainly a full package. You don't need a full package. You can use as many as you'd like. And it, you know what? If you're not an onion fan, then you could certainly mix the chives and maybe do a different herb if you'd like. But I do think that a green adds a nice little texture to it. All right, I think that's probably about enough. All right, I'm going to turn my mixer back on. So now I'm going to add the chives to it and let it finish mixing. While that's finishing, I'm going to come back to my board and you just want to spread a little flour out on it. Our mix is nicely done. So now we're going to take it out of our bowl. We're going to come back to our floured board. Flour your hands. It makes it a little easier for cleanup and getting the rest of the dough out. You don't want to work biscuit dough too much because they do get tough. 
So I'm going to kind of get it together a little bit. You want this to be about maybe an inch, maybe three quarters of an inch. I do like them to be a little high when they cook. They look prettier on a platter. You can see those nice delicious green chives in there. All right, I think that looks beautiful, nice and even. Now we're going to get a, a biscuit cutter here. I've got one that's probably about two inches or so. Again, if you want to use bigger, that's totally fine. All right, so we're going to cut our biscuits out. Push them out a little bit. <clears throat> All right, we'll move these to our parchment line tray waiting on the side. <clears throat> now you notice I did not work that dough very long. I don't want my biscuits to be tough. Roll that out again. About a half, uh, three quarters of an inch to about an inch or so. You're just going to keep cutting until you get all the dough pretty much used up. So now we're going to place it on our parchment lined sheet tray. Move this out of the way. And now we have an egg wash. Um, in the culinary world we call this glue. But we've mixed it up with just a little bit of water, not very much. We're going to come back and we're going to spread a little bit of egg wash on top of our biscuits. Now, and sometimes, if you're not going to use country ham like we are at the end, this would be a good time, too, to go ahead and sprinkle a little bit of kosher salt on top of these before they bake. Give a nice salty texture um, in complements with those chives. But in this case, we're not going to do the salt because we're going to load these with country ham. Going to go into a 400 degree oven for about 15, 20 minutes. All right, and now our biscuits have been in the oven for about 20 minutes or so. Keep in mind that something smaller or larger will take either a short amount of time or a longer amount of time to cook. These are about two inch biscuits. And I don't know if you remember when I talked about um, not uh, manipulating your dough so much and putting in the butter. Look at these nice, beautiful layers that this biscuit produced. I love these. These are absolutely perfect. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to cut a couple and put a little bit of Dijon mustard and country ham on them. These make excellent cocktail biscuits, um, nice brunch biscuits. Um, you can either choose to leave the chives out if you're not a chive or an onion fan or change out the herbs if you choose. That's totally fine. You know, recipes really are guidelines. They're not, um, there's no recipe police that are going to come knock on your door and tell you that you have to follow that recipe to a T. So I often encourage people to change out things if they don't care for certain ingredients. So we have some nice Dijon mustard on these. And then we're going to use one of my favorite ingredients. You can certainly tell I'm from the south. We are going to put some country ham some delicious country ham here on each biscuit. Put them on a nice serving platter. And there we have it. We have chive biscuits with country ham and Dijon mustard. I'm Tammy Brawley with The Green Kitchen. Join us next time on Heart of the Home. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafb.com slash recipes, as well as on Chef Tammy Brawley's website at greenkitchenrichmond.com. Most bakers prefer soft red winter wheat as the base for their biscuit flour. That's the class of wheat most commonly raised as a winter crop in Virginia. In 2019, 105,000 acres of winter wheat was harvested in the Old Dominion with a cash value of $32.5 million. Soft red wheat is lower in protein than typical bread flour, but not as low as cake flour. Many bakers use a combination of all-purpose flour and cake flour to end up with an extra flaky biscuit. The other vital ingredient is fat, usually shortening or cold butter that's literally chopped into the biscuit dough. Goats are a popular livestock choice for farmers with a small amount of land. Barry Ridgway reports more Virginia farmers are raising goats for meat and milk and as show animals. <laughs> Goats are smaller, more affordable, and easier livestock to manage than cattle for many Virginia producers, and some goats <laughs> seem to have individual personalities that can make them feel like part of the family. They make relatively good pets. People raise 
bottle kids and they make great companions. They're more like a dog than, than, than lambs, for, for example. Their personalities are really crazy and they all have different personalities. Some of them will come out as sweet and nice and calm as you can imagine and then others will come out buck wild. Farmers and researchers alike say a growing interest in raising goats stems from the growing ethnic markets for goat meat in the U.S. There were almost 49,000 goats on 3,500 Virginia farms in 2017, 125 more farms than five years earlier. Outside of the United States, goat meat is the largest consumed meat in the world. It is catching up in popularity in the United States with the ethnicity, diversity changing in our country. So it's a good thing for a goat farmer because uh, it raises value and uh, it gets more people interested in actually goats. Goat milk is a popular alternative drink for some consumers. It's also the base for a number of processed products like cheese, soaps, and skincare products. And a few producers have started their own goat landscaping business to help property owners clear difficult brush without machines or chemicals. Those goats will come through and there'll be nothing left from as high as they can reach down to the ground. It's green. They'll do poison ivy or thistles or anything like that. It's like candy. And as you can see on social media, some people are even doing yoga with goats. So goats are very useful animals. But what are the drawbacks to owning goats? First, while goats love to forage for plants, they require a special diet. And they don't just eat anything. It's a misconception of the old cartoons to where you see goats up eating car seats and tin cans and all this stuff. That's, that's not so. Goats really, we always joke that a goat could stump its toe and fall over dead. So it's not like they're rugged and can eat anything. Some breeds of goats are very susceptible to parasites and owners need to know the warning signs of this problem. Vilboy says encouraging the animals to graze higher than six inches will help prevent some parasite problems. That's usually not a problem for a goat. They climb, they jump on propane tanks, and they go through and cross fences. They climb us a little bit, so they're a lot more agile than most of the other forms of livestock that you have. Fencing is important, not only to keep the goats in, but also to keep predators out. Having guard dogs is also a good strategy against predators. Goats are also a popular choice for youth livestock programs. High school student Summer Kuntz has been working with her father to care for goats most of her life. She's learned valuable life lessons through the Culpeper County 4-H program. Oh my gosh, I've learned so much. I've learned about responsibility and commitment and, you know, I've learned so many things that kind of wants to get me into my career of being a veterinarian when I get older. It may be tempting to buy a few baby goats to start your own herd. But like any livestock operation, it pays to have a business plan first. You really have to start at the tail end of the business and see how are you going to market your animal. What's, what customer group are you targeting? Are you going to go to the ethnic market? And then what ethnic market are you going to go to? Do not put the cart before the horse, which so many of us usually do. You end up buying a couple goats and you bring them home and you're not ready with your pens or whatever type of shelter you're going to have for them. Make sure that you can be committed and that you have the time to take care of them and it's not something that you'll just throw in your backyard and say, oh, it'll be fine. Because they actually, they need so much work. The good news is if you're a new goat owner and have questions, there's help available. The goat community does seem to be very willing to share information and they're very polite. You hardly ever run across anybody that, uh, that isn't willing to share their story with you. You can also find other goat owners through social media or by contacting your county extension office. And professionals like Dr. Vildois conduct research on goat production and marketing at Virginia State University. In Culpeper County, Virginia, this is Barry Ridgway reporting. We're so glad you could join us this week to celebrate all the bounty Virginia has to offer. From the kitchen, to your home and garden, to our beautiful wide open spaces, we are proud to say that this is Real Virginia. For everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a great week. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always.
I just want to say thank you to all the guys. We've got some wonderful farmers in Powhatan. We've got probably the best farmers in the world right here in Virginia. And we want to say thank you. We know it's a tough job. Uh, it's, it's not a whole lot of big money rollers. Uh, but we want to thank you and God bless all of you guys. I want to say thank you for all that you do. I know it's difficult and very tiring. So thank you for having us to eat healthy, nutritious food. God bless you. You're going to need me. You're going to need us. All of us. You're going to need our help with your water, your air, your food. You're going to need our determination, our compassion. You're going to need the next generation of leaders to face the challenges the future will bring. And we promise we'll be there when you need us. Thank you so much because we really love the food and we know it's hard to grow it. You all work so hard and we're so appreciative of it. Thank you, farmers. Because if we're not appreciative, they might stop and then we won't have a lot of the stuff that we have today. Thank you for Brussels sprouts and raspberries. Thank you so much for raising the cows so that I can have milk every day. We have 37 parks across the Commonwealth. Every year, 10 million visitors enjoy 600 miles of trails from beaches to mountains hundreds of cabins and campsites, even yurts. We are Virginia State Parks. Those who struggle each and every single day just to make those ends meet, but still continue in this industry are the true role models for those of us who continue to grow in the agriculture industry. Especially those of us in FFA and 4-H, we youth organizations look up to you as you're the leaders of this industry. And we learn and we thank you for all that you do to help continue to support us. Thank you, Forward. Spending time outdoors has never felt more valuable. Whether it's exploring nature or relaxing in your yard, let's do it responsibly. Before going out, check for closures and fire restrictions. Practice social distancing, even when outside and on the trail. Back at home with burning yard debris, keep your pile small. And no matter where you are, be sure to properly extinguish any outdoor fire. Drown, stir, drown, feel. We're all in this together. Help keep our safe places safe. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. Did you know dragging chains can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires.